Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. We have several announcements, so let's get right to it. Welcome to all. If you are visiting here for the very first time I, I, and you don't have a church home, I pray that you will think about First Presbyterian. We are a warm, the warmest, most friendliest church around. So blessings to all. Please sign the friendship pad and pass it along your row. Um, today, we are blessed to have Brooke and JC with us. They are going to do a beautiful duet today, but unfortunately, this is JC's very last Sunday with us. He has been such a blessing. Um, he and Brooke will both be graduating on Saturday, and uh, they sang a recital together at PC, and I know they're both so very gifted, so we're, we're happy you're with us today. And uh, our prayers go with you, J.C., and all that God has for you. I know he has great plans for both of you. And I pray that, that you will be moved by the Holy Spirit, however God leads. Uh, last week was our youth service, and wasn't it amazing? Didn't our youth and our children do such a good job? Uh, Murphy and Jackson both brought music and preaching, and uh, it blessed my heart and my soul. We are blessed to have all of our children here. Um, the PW had their gathering on Thursday evening. Jerry Perkins led the study, and Susan Byers was honored with lifetime membership. Um, beautiful evening, and a great time was had by all. Congratulations to Bill and Amanda Childers who tied the knot on Friday at 4 o'clock right here in our sanctuary. Um, and we wish them a lifetime of happiness. We are also blessed that Amanda is joining our church this morning, and we welcome her warmly. You'll be a great addition, as you already have been here at First Presbyterian. Um, in two weeks, May 20th, there is going to be a reception following worship to bid me farewell. Eighteen months went fast. I think it did. But this will be a wonderful celebration, and I look forward to it. It will be following, immediately following worship. And um, that evening, we will have our family night supper, so more fun for the day. It will be a big day, full of fun, and lots of eating. So we hope that you will be here for that very special day. I will actually preach. My last sermon will be the following week. Um, so if you have to miss that, then we still have time to say our goodbyes. Yesterday, your new pastor, Mike McCracken, was examined at Presbytery meeting at Little Mountain Presbyterian Church in Abbeville. He joined our presbytery and was welcomed into, into the presbytery. And we had several church members in attendance. We had a nice big group. In fact, it was noted, probably the largest group we've ever had at presbytery, to welcome a new pastor. So um, we look with great excitement for, um, for his coming. Other announcements. Uh, tomorrow evening is our evening at uh, Roma, so I hope you will come and enjoy our, um, our, annual, our monthly dinner that we share together. Uh, prayer concerns. We continue to pray for Wayne Wicker. He will be having back surgery uh, sometime within the next month, so continued prayers that that will alleviate his pain. Bob Morris continued prayers for him. I saw him this week, and he's looking great. Prayers for Tommy Herger having a PET scan this coming Wednesday, and we just pray that it will go well. Donna Smith recuperating from her recent health problems. While she was in the hospital, her, her father, Don, had a, uh, learned about, it was talking to Donna's cardiologist in the, uh, to make a long story short, he went to the cardiologist, found out he had 99% blockage, and had uh, two stents put in to one of his arteries, so could have saved his life. So thanks be to God that, um, that he learned that. My mother, Emma, you've been praying for her. She's better. She's still in rehab in the hospital, but she's had some rough days, but she's on the mend. 
Thanks be to God. I'm not quite ready to let her go yet. So thank you for your prayers. I do greatly appreciate that. And also prayers for the McCracken family. As they prepare to leave their church and pack up all their belongings and move to Lawrence, they need our prayers. They are so excited to come. And I could not be more excited for this church. He will be just just exactly what you need. Um, And that's what God had in mind all along. Let us worship the Lord. I wouldn't have done that, but I need to do it today. (laughs) In the fifth commandment, God declares to us, honor your father and your mother. Sixty years ago, the Presbyterian churches in South Carolina gave concrete obedience to this commandment by opening the first Presbyterian community in Somerville. In 1958, 20 older mothers and fathers of our churches entered that new home built by Presbyterians. They found fellowship, opportunities to remain mentally and physically active, and a helping touch when needed. The ministry of Presbyterian communities has proved to be one of the most successful undertaking of our churches in South Carolina. Today, over 900 older adults reside at multiple communities across the state. While a lot has changed over the last 60 years, the purpose of Presbyterian communities has not. It continues to be an expression of the care South Carolina Presbyterians have for older adults who are no longer able or willing to live at home alone. Jean Can and I serve as ambassadors for the Presbyterian community in Clinton. We attend the meetings and try to keep up with current events. Some things you need to know if your loved one is considering you or a loved one. There are 15 new apartments called Heritage Court in Clinton, now available. Currently, the entrance fee is being waived on several, making it an economical move to get into one of those. You do not have to be a Presbyterian to live in the communities, but you can find other friends living there. I'm trying to cut this shorter. Um, One thing that I think everyone needs to know, if you enter Presbyterian home before you're in the health care part. You can go in a house, an apartment, whatever. If something happens, you can move through the system. And if you run out of money, that's what the Mother's Day offering is for. But if you wait until you're unhealthy and go to the healthy part, I mean, yeah, well, that part, the <laughs> hospital part, and your money runs out, that is not true. Peter Hobby makes a really great um, presentation about moving there. He moved there when he was the youngest person there and he's been there four years. Next Sunday we will have an opportunity to keep the fifth commandment by giving generously to the Mother's Day offering. Your gift will be used exclusively to provide charitable care for those residents who have outlived their life savings. By honoring our fathers and mothers in this way, you help ensure that they can continue to live with Presbyterian communities. stand for our call to worship. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord heals the brokenhearted. And binds up their wounds. The Lord delights in those who fear him. Who put their hope in his unfailing love. Let us worship the Lord. Let us worship.
the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? There is nothing in all creation that shall be able to separate us From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. be seated.
That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. And now we'll have our children to come forward, and William Smith is going to be bringing us the message. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, we got a we got a light crowd today. And one guy and all these girls. All right. Got them all to yourself and your sister. Good morning. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, does anybody know what a slogan is? You ever, you, have you ever heard the word slogan? You know what a slogan is? You've heard a slogan before. There's a shoe company out there. They have one real famous. I don't even know if they still use it or not, but it's Nike. I don't know if anybody's got Nikes on, but you know what Nike shoes are. They had a slogan that was what? Anybody heard of this? It's called Just Do It. They thought that was their tag. That was their line. Just do it. McDonald's had one, and they may have changed it from now. You know McDonald's, the restaurant with the golden arches. They had one. It's called, it's, they said, I'm loving it. There's all kind of slogans out there. If you had a slogan, if you had a slogan about you, what would it be? What would it be? If, what about something you like? Something you really like? What do you like? Baseball? Star Wars? Okay. Baseball? Star Wars? Okay. You know, maybe your slogan might be Star Wars fan or something like that. You know? Baseball, apple pie, hot dogs, and Chevy and Lawrence, right? Yeah, there you go. Okay. I like that. No. If you had a slogan, you could think what a slogan would tell people, maybe people that don't know you, a little bit about you, you know? Say, what, what is she about? What, what, what's, what, what does she do? What does she like? You, do you know our church has a slogan? Do you know that? It's not just do it. It's not loving it or whatever. You know that? Our church has a slogan. It's actually called a mission statement. I'm going to read it real quick. Our church's slogan is this, a worshiping community of disciples of Jesus Christ seeking to welcome, equip, transform, and witness as a family of faith. That could be our church's slogan, if you will. Now, that's kind of a lot to get out, you know, if you, if you wanted to put it out there. But, but that's what's written on all of our, all of everything that goes out. That's our slogan, if you will. You know, uh, in, our, in some scripture, there's a story that Jesus was talking to people in, in the book of John. And he's talking to them about uh, what's important to him. And, and people want to know, like they, they, they realize that this is a man of God. This is the, the prophet they waited on. And what's important? What, what, what trips his trigger? What's important to him? So he starts talking and he talks about love and loving others. But he starts out with how he has been loved by the Father. So, his Father God. So he loves others in response to that. In John 12, he said he commands us to love. He actually says, what he says is, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So verse 12, he says, My command is this, that you love one another. And then in a few verses later, in verse 17, he says, he finishes up, he said, this is my command. Like, this is the real big biggie. He says, love one another. So, love one another. And loving people, how, how does it, what does it mean to love people? Does it mean just to feel good about them? Because we do love our family members and our friends. We love those, right? Don't you? Yeah? Okay. But what does it mean to love people that you don't even know? Can you do that? I know I saw you look like, huh? That's, that's a different, it's a different kind of love. But how does it look, what is it to love other people that you don't know? Well, when we talk about loving people we don't know, if we take up an offering in this church, some money, for instance, or we fill a shoebox and we send it, do you know who it goes to? Do you know who it goes to? Yeah, but do you know the kid's name that got it? No, you don't. Does anybody know who gets the money that we might send somewhere? So how can you... People that live there, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
But God is calling us to love people that we don't really know. And he calls us to do that. And that, that's hard to do, you know? That's kind of contrary to what we want to do. I want to love the people around me, and I want to love the people that love me back. But God, God's bigger than that. He says, I want you to love, you can love those people, I want you to love people of different colors, different faiths, different backgrounds. I want you to love everybody. And it's our responsibility to do that. So it's our duty as a church to do that. And that's why we have that mission statement, our slogan like that. Um, so loving people is pretty important. If it was important to Jesus to say it, to command it, a command is like, you're going to do it. I want you to do this. If he commanded it in two verses that are real close to each other, it must be important to him. So if Jesus had a slogan, what might that be? What would Jesus' slogan be? There you go, God. Give me five. That's right. If Jesus had a slogan, I think it might be love people. Not love money, not love good times, not love cars, baseball, whatever, and that's okay, but to love people. To love people. That's what he would tell us to do. You know what? So if that's important to Jesus... Let's let it be important to us, okay? Good. Let's hold hands real quick and we're going to pray, okay? And let's keep, our, let's keep our minds about loving people this week, okay? You all repeat after me, okay? Dear God, if loving people is important to you, then help me to do that. Amen. Thanks. Please be seated. Let us turn our thoughts and hearts and minds unto God now as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray.
Holy God, we pray that you would still our hearts and thoughts and minds, that as we are in this sacred place, you would take away our worries just for a bit. You would take away our thoughts of what we're going to do later in the day just for a bit, that we might truly be here for we are in the presence of God. We are in your presence and your glory fills this beautiful sanctuary. Are we worthy? You have made us worthy. May we in this service receive a peace that the world does not know. May we know how much you love us. May we be forgiven and set free to try again. May we be comforted. May we be like a child sitting on our parents' lap, knowing that everything will be all right. We thank you for the beautiful music we've heard today, for the joy of just being in a worship service, being able to worship you. Too much of the time we focus on what's wrong in our lives. But here today we can remember what's right. Loving God, we lift up to you all those who are in special need of your healing power. We lift up to you, my mother, Emma, and say a prayer of thanksgiving that you've brought her through her illness, and I pray continued healing upon her, that in these her last days and months and years that you will give her joy. I pray for Wayne as he goes into surgery, that this will be a perfect surgery with a perfect outcome and that you will anoint the hands of the surgeon. Pray for continued strength for Bob Morris. You have been so faithful to that man. May you continue to bring healing to him. We lift up Donna Smith and her dad, Don, and pray continued healing for both of them. Prayers for Tommy as he goes in for a PET scan that he will get the results that he needs to hear. We lift up our minister and his wife and their three precious children. I pray that your spirit will be with Mike and Jennifer as they begin to say their goodbyes as they pack up all of their belongings, and as they come to make Lawrence their home, their new home. I pray that in this next three weeks, next four weeks, that you will ready our hearts to receive them, to have open hearts and open minds, to listen to what he has to say. For we believe that you are already speaking to him. He is the one you've chosen to come. And I say thank you, Lord, for the good years that are coming. Lord, I pray for each of us, those places in our lives where sometimes our faith may falter. May you shore up our faith. Give us strength to face all the challenges of life. May you give us a peace. And now we join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, first of all, Psalm 147, verses 1 to 11, and verse 20. 
can be found on the back of our bulletin. You can open your Bible or you can listen. Listen now for the word of God. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the numbers of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Praise the Lord. Amen. And from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 28, one of my very favorite passages. During this last month, I have veered from the lectionary, and I'm choosing the passages that I like the best. And so this is one of them. Listen now for the word of God. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Here in Lawrence, we are blessed to be just three and a half to four hours from the beach. And a little over an hour from the mountains. What a geographical wonder. It makes it nice to be able to get away for a week or a weekend's vacation. We humans, you know, are drawn to nature. For nature is a window to heaven, I believe. A window to the heart of God. When you're sitting on a beach and staring out at the ocean, you can imagine how people have done this since the very first human walked the face of the earth. Or looking out at a vast mountain range, you can imagine Native Americans roaming the ridges and the valleys. Technology is wonderful, but for me, it disconnects me from God. I don't know if it's true for you. It keeps my head and my mind 
uh, my head in, in my mind, keeps me in my head and my mind. Nature helps me to be in the moment, to connect with the wonder and the mystery and the majesty of God's creation. I can put away the computer, the iPhone, the iPad, the television, and I can just be. My friends, we do not do this often enough. But in that moment when I'm just being, I know that God is in all things and in all places and at all times. But especially at the beach, in the mountains, in our backyard, our minds are clear and we feel his presence there. We feel at peace. Our New Testament passage talks about nature and about God's children and the plans and the dreams that God has for us. This is a passage full of excitement and hopeful expectation. It's a very appropriate text to ponder as we look with hopeful expectation to the arrival of our new pastor and his family. Paul writes about this hopeful expectation in verses 18 and 19 of Romans chapter 8. He writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Now another way of translating these verses Nature stands on tiptoe, waiting for God's glory to be revealed in and through God's children. God's glory is God's shining essence. Paul tells us that we too will take on God's shining essence, his glory. Can you even imagine? And all of creation is waiting eagerly and expectantly for God's glory to be revealed in and through us. He goes on to say in verses 22 and 23 that we know the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. What Paul is saying here is that God is giving birth to something amazing and new. The birth pains are already beginning. Remember now that God never stopped being the creator. Even on that seventh day when God rested, Actually, if you go back, it actually says he created even on the seventh day and then rested. He was and still is our loving creator, birthing newness and aliveness to our world each and every day. Life goes on, my friends, because of God's continual life-giving energy and work. So what is the something amazing and new? that God is giving birth to. I believe God is giving birth to us. Elsewhere in 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God is in the process of giving birth to the new creation, to us to our life in Christ. In this world, God is already beginning to make us new. We are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, which means that God's Holy Spirit works on us from the inside out. With God setting up his home inside our hearts and our spirits, we become kinder and gentler and forgiving in a word more like Christ. But this is only the beginning. God has a surprise waiting for us when we leave this place, as we all shall one day. 
This is what nature or creation is standing on tiptoe to see. God's plan for each of us will be complete when we are born into the next life. We will shine with God's glory, with God's shining essence. We will be made new from head to toe, inside and out. Now this is not just wishful thinking. This is a promise from God. Our loved ones who have died in this life are now alive with God's shining essence. We can't see it, but we know it, don't we? Most of us have lost parents and grandparents. Some of us have lost husbands and wives. Few of us have lost children or grandchildren. There's nothing worse in life than losing someone we dearly love. Nearly 17 years ago, our nation lost 3,000 beautiful souls who passed in the terrible tragedy of 9-11. It was a heartbreak beyond comprehension. Countless children, grandchildren, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, friends lost people they loved in an instant without time to prepare or say goodbye. This was the deadliest terrorist attack in world history. And yet, even in this horrific scene of death and terror and trauma, Paul assures us that our present sufferings, and it doesn't get worse than that, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Thank heavens that this life is not all that there is. In fact, I believe that this life is a mere shadow of what I call the real life that we will know when we leave this place. There will be no sadness, no heartache, no struggle, no suffering, no pain. We will be made whole and complete, shimmering with God's glory. God's shining essence. And the suffering of this world will be a distant memory. We will be reunited with precious loved ones who have long since left us. And we will live in this state of peace and joy for eternity, which is, my friends, a very, very long time. It will be God's ultimate surprise. I can hardly wait. But what about this life? Where is our hope now? Where do we find that hope? Our hope is found in verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now this is not to say that there is not sorrow and tragedy in life, even for those who love God. I remember years ago, hearing our college campus minister preach on this text. Brother Lee and his wife had lost a son who died from a terrible illness at the age of two or three. The kind of tragedy you don't ever get over. You just survive from. He said for the longest time this verse made him so angry. There's simply no good that can come from the death of a little boy. No good at all. Now I can't remember how, uh, how he ever resolved his anger at God for taking away his little boy. But I do remember how I felt when he talked about it. For I had just lost my father two years earlier and I couldn't imagine how being fatherless at the age of 18 could be a good thing either. We all carry sorrows in a tiny corner of our hearts. That sorrow never goes away. This life is full of sorrows and disappointments and sadness. But for me, this verse brings me hope and comfort. For I do believe that God brings good even even from the most tragic of circumstances. You see, Brother Lee, 
I believe, went on to seminary, went into the ministry as a result of losing his son. He became a campus minister. And he was the first person to plant a seed in my mind that I might want to go to seminary and become a minister myself. After 9-11... Joey's National Guard unit was called up for active duty in Maryland, where Joey was given an opportunity to transfer to the regular Army, full-time Army chaplain ministry. Only during a six-month period of time could he do that, because he was already a major in the National Guard. If it were not for 9-11, that tragedy of all tragedies, we would not be in the army. And I would not be standing here in the pulpit this morning. We don't know how God will use the worst of the worst suffering to bring about comfort and healing and change in the lives of those around us. We never know how our own suffering will give us the opportunity to minister to others who hurt. No experience in life, my friends, is ever wasted. God is going to squeeze out everything you've ever done, everything you've ever known, to minister to God's people. God himself knew suffering, remember. By giving up his own son, his only child, to die on the cross. Even though it looked like God's experiment on earth with Jesus was a horrible failure, God had a surprise up his sleeve. God used betrayal and murder to bring about salvation and redemption. Our God is a God who works things together for good. Though it appears that our world is falling apart and all is lost. I hear that every day from lots of people. The world is lost. In reality, my friends, the Holy Spirit is actively at work right now, today, in our own land, bringing healing and hope and comfort and peace to us and to all people who suffer The good news is that God is about to work his miracle right here at First Presbyterian Church in Lawrence, South Carolina. This church is about to come alive like it has never done before. God has big plans for this church, and he is bringing a pastor whose very own vision meets God's own vision for this community. All along, God has been working things together for good for this church. Reverend McCracken and his family are coming home to the Carolinas. It may be the different one that he grew up in, but that's okay. He's close. We are gaining a pastor full of energy and enthusiasm. His gifts and our needs are being matched perfectly. God working things together for good. There's no telling the good work and ministry that will come out of this church in the coming years. But this we do know. When we love God and trust God, when we are called according to the purposes of God, we can expect only God's goodness and blessing. God's will shall be done, and it will be a glorious thing to see. As we all stand on tiptoe, waiting expectantly to see what's coming next, may we know that God is about to birth something beautiful and good here at our church. New people will come and join with us. Lives will be transformed. New missions and ministries will bring compassion and hope to people in need. Reverend McCracken and his family will be a blessing to us. And we will be a blessing to this community and the world. The Holy Spirit 
will empower us to do all that God is dreaming of for us to do, and God's glory will shine in us and through us. It's going to be good. All of it is going to be so good. The waiting is nearly over. May we, each one of us, open our hearts to receive Reverend McCracken with joy and trust and love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, my friends, let us stand and affirm our faith as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. Children of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And now let us uh, continue to worship God as we bring to God our tithes and gifts and offerings.
let us pray. Oh, loving God, we bring these gifts to you with happy and grateful hearts. Thank you for all the blessings you give to us, and may these gifts be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 550, Give Praise to the Lord. To God give the glory for all that God has done for us. Praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen.